This is The Idea of Global Philosophy in an Age of Deglobalization by John Simmons, forthcoming in global philosophy, and this was uh, suggested by Val Poquet. So, as always, let me know what you think along the way, and uh, eventually this will all be saved for uh, posterity. And it'll it's also going to be up on the YouTube. So if you're in YouTube, hi from uh, Twitch. But yeah. Oh, another fun thing that happened. Someone commented today, just like an hour ago, on the first philosophy roulette I uploaded. Because the first one, I think I... Uh, I don't know if I uploaded it. But like the first one on YouTube is like number two. Um, and so someone was asking about... It was this paper on the principle of sufficient reason by Chris McDaniels. And someone was asking me about that. I'm like, I have no idea what I said in that paper. But like... Yeah, <laughs> it was just really funny. I was like, wow, someone went back and found the first one. So, anywho, this is the idea of global philosophy in an age of deglobalization by John Simmons, forthcoming in global philosophy. So it's like, yep, people will comment. All right, global philosophy is an ideal. It includes the affirmation of intercultural philosophy and internationalism, but it goes well beyond cultural and geographic cosmopolitanism. To embrace global philosophy is to reject any approach to philosophy that cleaves to cleaves too closed to closed communities and private conversations. Okay, so we're just starting off saying, hey, you have to make it available to everyone. This is like kind of be a public thing. It is true that throughout history and currently in some parts of the world, philosophers are subject to coercion and suppression from governments and other powerful forces. Under those circumstances, philosophical inquiry must be conducted secretly. This is not, like, new. Um, this has always been the case. You know, people have had stuff published after they die and people are like, oh well you know the church will come after you back in the day that's happening now here and now all the time one of my professors in college he got in a lot of trouble in uh, china but i mean he was an older guy so it was like you know during the uh, uh cultural re revolution they were very bad on some academics that that they felt were um anti-communist or communist in the wrong way and uh, still, there's other places that are, you know, depending on what you're working on, this can be very dangerous for you. And it's like, this is not anything new, and it's not changed in the past. It just shifted to, like, something, um, you know, the problems of the old are main, maybe not what we have problems now, but there are still, like, people who have to be very careful about what they say and how they say it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Simmons says, but this is not the case for most of us today. Moreover, with the proliferation of relatively affordable online communication, it is easier than ever for philosophers from around the world to read one another's work, to engage with one another, and to collaborate cooperatively. Current conditions favor a genuinely global philosophy that is open to all and that opposes barriers to inquiry erected in the name of traditions, communities, nations, and specializations. Can there really be a global philosophy, or do practical constraints mean that it must remain an un unrealized ideal? Insofar as people are embodied and situated within specific society and a specific geographic location, philosophy always comes from some place in tradition. The places where philosophers and their work originate inevitably shape philosophical inquiry, the material conditions, politics, and history of a place organize the way the questions, the way questions are asked, and the topics that are considered important. Tindarius, how are you? How are you? Welcome in. Good morning to you, uh, yourself. Hope things are good in Europe. Yeah, couldn't be longer in bed? Well, I mean, let's see. It's probably, yeah, getting on early morning for you over, I think you're in Europe. Sleepy? Uh, this is the end of my day in, uh, you know, the United States. Okay, yeah, you're only, oh, you're only at 2 a.m. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you were, like, it was like early morning or is it like late night? No, it's uh, like 8 p.m. here and uh, I feel okay. Um, who knows? Who knows? Um, <laughs> I'm doing all right. So but we got this uh, short paper that's forthcoming from John Simmons and we're talking about philosophy at large. And I'm trying to think of ways to... Uh, oh, you went to bed at 5 p.m. Okay. So yeah, you probably got some... Uh, sleeping and now you're up at the wrong time of day depending on what you do with yourself of course but yeah hope you're well like sleep schedule notwithstanding um yeah i'm all right it's like cold and rainy i went out for a walk and i got my socks wet that was annoying like <laughs> like that's like why are my socks wet like that's annoying but yeah i took off my socks that's what happened okay anywho 
we're just talking about like a localization of philosophy. Like no matter where you are, you're always somewhere and in some time. So your philosophy is going to be affected by that. Uh, analytic philosophy likes to think that it is without time, but like, or it's like, you know, you do some logic. It doesn't matter when you do the logic. It's always going to hold. It's not true because, you know, whatever questions you're asking with the logic are going to be affected by your time and place and what you think is important. And so however you apply the logic, even if the logic is the ancient logic, like propositional logic that the Stoics developed, that hasn't changed a whole lot in the last 2000 years. So it is kind of timeless, the logic, but any question you're asking about it is going to be a time and place. So like, it's always going to matter. All right. So, yeah. So, you let me know, Tindarius, if anything interesting is going on. Just hopefully you uh, you feel okay, depending on your how you slept. Okay. But to do philosophy well, one must look beyond the confines of place, community, and tradition to imagine the stranger who has not yet read our work. Good philosophers already carefully consider objections and anticipate their crit critics. Thus, in an important sense, excellent philosophical work is engaged with unfamiliar and even hostile audiences. I count myself as generally a hostile audience. I'm not, like, nice to, like, philosophy in general. Like, if, like, I know Viper's uh, Gratitude, who's here quite often, now is one of the, mo is one of the mods, <laughs> has commented uh, that, like, I basically tear everything up. Yes, exactly. Hostile audience. Like, this is like what a philosophy... This is what John Simon says. Excellent philosophical work is engaged with unfamiliar and even hostile audiences. So, to be good, you have to be hostile here. I consider myself hostile, and I was going to say, you vipers have commented that, like, I basically have made... I tear a lot of stuff down. Like, I am a hostile audience. And this is one of the things. It's funny, on Twitch, a lot of the, um... Ah, God damn it, pre-roll, uh ads are back sorry about that but um like the other educational streamers a lot of them you know the science people and whatnot they're always trying to you know be positive i'm not like i feel significantly different from them because i don't feel like i'm a positive force for a lot of things i'm reading <laughs> so yeah anyway okay philosophy is a collective activity and insofar as we record our inquiry we record our inquiry at all Hey, this is recorded right now. We direct our work to future audiences. Yes. Hello, YouTube. A philosophical writing is always directed towards a future interlocutor, but it also ought to be aware of a contemporary reader from another place or tradition. The idea of global philosophy represents the hope that we can increase cross-cultural collaboration and exchange to promote a more internationalist approach to philosophical inquiry. Valpo says, this is the Nietzschean side of analytic philosophy. I don't want friends. I want opponents. That's fair. It, like I didn't I never thought of it I uh, never considered it to be Nietzschean but like that's true like their uh, analytic philosophy is in some sense a little too obsessed with the Socratic ideal of like a combative argument um yeah and so that's a good point like you want someone that can like you know make you work better but like that's not always really good and it's very um it's troublesome sometimes like you're not always going to be better just because you have an opponent Tindaria says, it's interesting that you always got the interest to deep dive into, you always got the interest to deep dive into the, these papers. For me, the thought is always like, I could be reading a book instead, why don't I? Yeah, I can tell you why, and this is more psychological than anything else, why I do what I do. It's that I get very frustrated when I start to see uh, just like dumb problems in books. And I gotta go, I, I'm sure I just was not reading the right books, but like I get very frustrated with media. I'm like, I can see what's coming. I know it's coming, and then when it happens, I just get annoyed. And so it's like I gotta go find uh, like authors that are a bit that are not thinking like me. But I got tired with media, and so it's like I could be reading a book, but it's like it's gonna be the it, it, it turns into the same experience for me. I'm like I've seen this idea before. I see what's coming, and it's like you're not actually helping. And this is my this is a failing on my part is that I have not found good authors, and I stopped looking. And that's a you know a ding on me. But, like, that's why I read this stuff, because it's kind of all the same to me. Like, it's, like, this is kind of, like, philosophy doesn't count as fiction, but it ain't the truth either. It's, like, people making stuff up about the world. And so it kind of is, like, a fiction book. Um, yeah. So that's it. Yeah, so this is the funny thing. 
It's like when John Simmons says uh, the hope that we can increase cross-cultural collaboration and exchange. Like we are on Twitch right now. The idea of like the culture of philosophy and academia and exchange that like me and all the other sort of educational streamers uh, do is like this is the cross culture of like gaming versus uh, academia. It's an interesting uh, little thing. So it's definitely a question of like what who is always the public and like what is this cross culture um, that's going on? Yeah. Arguably, we are living in the period of history most conducive to the practice of philosophy so far. The problems that contemporary civilization faces are severe, but they require rational, but they yeah, require rational, imaginative, and morally sensitive responses. Philosophers, along with other humanists and artists, will offer new ways of understanding new solutions to problems and will provide a deepened access to and insights into what it means to be human in an age of artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and climate change. Viper says, gaming and academia, the crossroads of not having sex. There is a, uh, yeah, you are not wrong. <laughs> so. <sighs> yeah. These are concerns that have global implications, and this new context is already testing the capacities of traditional institutions. For example, while our universities, colleges, and the system of academic publish publishing inherit a venerable tradition, venerable and rich tradition of excellence, they are subject to capture by local interests in ways that hamper their genuine mission. Uh, Tindaria says, oh, in our, this is back to Valpo's con. In, in Germany, our modern philosophers are more like, listen to me, I know it all, I can fix all your problems, I am relevant, buy my books and don't criticize my genius. Yeah, that's capitalism for you. It's like, I know the solution, I will solve your problems, just buy my books, I swear. So, yeah. Oh, so they renamed the journal. All right, I don't know what this was. Yeah, Valpo, what was this? Do we know? So this is like an editorial of a journal. Interesting. I didn't know what this was. Okay, by renaming the journal Global Philosophy, I hope to signal a new model of philosophical publishing that is not directly tethered to the established Anglo-American or Western European disciplinary hierarchies. This will be a journal that is awake to and inclusive of philosophy in, of the wider world. Hey, I should submit my uh, paper to this. Not as the work is imagined through Anglo-American eyes, but as it is genuinely practiced in the philosophical communi communities of Asia, Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and the Islamic world. Oh, you don't know. Okay, see, this is, like, super interesting. I don't know what John Simons is up to. All right, for those who don't know, like, he, as a grad student, and me as an undergrad, had the same advisor. Like, we're from the same, like, area. Like, we were very interested in, uh, well, he's... Uh, Vipers. He's like of Irish descent. He's an American of Irish descent. So he's written in English. But yeah. Um, yeah, and you'd like him. I tried getting you to read some of his stuff. He's a philosopher of computation. You'd like his work. But um, what was I saying? Yeah, also, he worked with a philosophy organization, I think, out of uh, either Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or something. I forget. I think it was the Saudis. And, like, he was doing stuff during the pandemic with um, uh, Islamic uh, philosophy uh, stuff and doing, like, uh, in-depth interviews with, like, big philosophers that was uh, funded by, I think, the Saudi government to, like, you know, actually attempt to do a, uh, like, international philosophy uh, outreach. So that, like, the people over there were able to um, get insight from, like, or at least have conversation with, like, uh, English-speaking philosophers. So, the Western philosophers. Okay. The conversations that happen in these places will not always be easily embraced by those with Western European or North American sensibilities. And sometimes genuinely global philosophy will involve friction, discomfort, or even fundamental disagreement. This is as it should be. Um, if you always, you can always do, um, boom, like that, uh, exclamation point paper always, uh, brings up the paper. So, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, and that's what I was going to say. So if I'm sympathetic to anyone in philosophy, this is one of the few people I actually happen to be sympathetic to this writer. You know, where's Tindarius, but like I, it gets used so rarely that people actually want to take a look at the paper. Yeah. So, and if you're in YouTube, the link will be in the uh, show notes below. <laughs> yeah, 
it's all I have to comment that this is like one of the few times I have to like give a disclaimer that I actually know this guy and I think he's good. <laughs> Okay, those of us working within the philosophical mainstream are susceptible to the illusion that our assumptions and perspectives are universal and not conditioned by our own economic and cultural circumstances. We are often blind, for example, to the ways that hierarchies in the Anglo-American academic world emerge or how matters of style, method, and choice of subject matter are shaped by local considerations that are not intrinsically connected to philosophical excellence. Thus, it will be necessary for Global Philosophy to have an editorial board that represents all interested philosophical communities. In the coming years, I will work to redesign and grow the journal in ways that make it a premier venue for 21st century global philosophy. This will involve a redesign of the peer review practices of the journal aiming to maintain excellence while coping with the reality of large-scale contemporary academic publishing. Some of these changes will be discussed below in more detail. Okay, so now we're actually talking about like the ins and outs of like running a philosophy journal. This is kind of interesting. Like how do you actually deal with like international peoples? Okay, deglobalization in intellectual life and the reemergence of national philosophies. There are significant headwinds. Not that long ago, one could read confident one could read confident predictions about the coming efflorescence of global philosophy. Tom Brooks wrote that the future of philosophy is moving toward a global philosophy and he characterized it as, quote, the idea of global philosophy is the view that different philosophical approaches may engage more substantially with each other to solve philosophical problems. That assertion of the value of global philosophy has been challenged. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and the growing tensions between the United States and China, it has become common to hear that we are entering a period of deglobalization in trade, politics, and cultural life. Deglobalization is the process of reducing the interconnectedness and interdependence of countries, regions, and e economies around the world. We see it in the effects of trade, investment, financial flows, migration, and cultural exchange. In economic life, we see it in the rise of protectionist trade policies and economic barriers such as tariffs and quotas, along with the increasing use of onshoring and localization strategies, which involve producing goods and services closer to where they will be consumed rather than relying on a global supply chains. Deglobalization was accelerated by the pandemic as countries imposed travel restrictions and other measures that disrupted supply chains and cross-border economic activity. In academic life, we see a less obvious kind of deglobalization. In many societies, there are increasing calls for technological applications of research, for the deployment of research in the service of national and commercial priorities, etc. The demand that academic inquiry be relevant is not necessarily misguided, but it is important that we have a non-arbitrary and reflective attitude toward relevance. Philosophers have traditionally been in the position to offer critical assessment of these pressures. We can ask what it means for scholarly research to be relevant and to whom. To specific uh, to specific corporate or political interests, to the interests of dominant ideological faction, to some unexamined notion of scientific or technological progress. Deglobalization <clears throat> excuse me. Deglobalization affects the lives of philosophers in other ways. In the United States, we have seen an increasingly suspicious attitude toward Chinese scholars and an increasingly security-driven and proprietary attitude towards intellectual property. In our discipline, localisms are a bit more subtle than in the sciences and engineering, but they still constitute strongly opposing forces to the idea of global philosophy. While relatively few contemporary philosophers would regard themselves as engaged in something like a national philosophy and are mostly committed to a kind of intellectual cosmopolitanism, in our inquiry, we are not immune to deglobalization. <clears throat> Explicit commitment to national philosophies is rarely voiced. However, it has been a prominent option for philosophers since the 19th century. This happened initially in the formation of, na of nation states in Europe, but also as part of decolonialization in the second half of the 20th century. Bhikkhu Parekh describes how Jara, uh, Jara, uh, sorry, I can't say anything that's not basic English. Jawaharlal Nehru saw the creation of an Indian national philosophy as integral to the cons consolidation of the newly independent state. Similarly, Zambia's first president, Kenneth uh, Kaunda, chose Zambian human humanism as the Zambian national philosophy. Many other instances of philosophy in the service of national projects could be mentioned here. In contemporary Russia, for example, the idea of a national philosophy is gaining ground and plays, and plays a central political role in the cultural life of the country. 
we are beginning to see indications of a retreat from the ideals of internationalism that were championed so courageously by refugees from Central Europe in the mid 20th century. Philosophers like Otto Neurath, Rudolf Carnap, and others argued for and helped to cultivate an international movement in philosophy. Um, yeah, I mean, if you the history of those guys, they were running from the world wars, though. And so they wanted to avoid those like the world wars, uh, those errors. So that history is old now, though, and our problems aren't the same. Similarly, in 1937, the International Institute of Philosophy was founded by the Swedish philosopher Ake uh, Petzal. Sorry if I say that wrong, along with the Francis uh, Francois Raymond Baker, Emile Brehir and Leon Robin. Uh, Robin. The IIP was a significant institution in the post-war development of philosophy and remains committed to internationalism. With the arrival of refugee and immigrant philosophers, the influence of internationalism was baked into the development of American philosophy in the second half of the 20th century. During the 21st century, this influence has diminished for reasons I will discuss below. Yeah, I mean, the upheaval in the first half of the 20th century. Tindarius, thank you. Oh, my alerts are busted again. Sorry, you didn't get the alerts. Let's see. Does it even say they're busted? Let's find out. Why did the alert not go off? Dag nabbit. Let me see something. Yeah. Alerts are down. Oh, my dev didn't click. Hmm. Why are my alerts down? That's weird. Uh. Well, I'm refreshing them. Hopefully... They'll come back. But yeah. Uh, let's see. Can I replay that? No, I can't. I should fix that somehow. But all right. Thank you for the uh, sub. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Thanks for the support. Thank you. Uh, clicky, clicky. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let this thing. The screw ups of the. Um, World Wars in the first half of the 20th century made everyone move around, and so they were trying to find some way to um, prevent that from happening again. And one way to do that, they said, all right, we're going to, like, you know, make international organizations that uh, will, you know, be a buffer against people like certain countries going to war and starting, like, one of these, like, giant wars among everybody else. But then what we've got we've got all the problems we have now where again we've just got a different setup and again and now we're trying to you know pandemic and other problems people realize we can't deal with the complete uh internationalization of everything it doesn't work because the supply chains are bad um and you know everyone knows the problems nowadays in politics you can like you get the reactionary politics against it because people are like it's nuts uh, like relying on everyone else when we could, you know, do better ourselves. That's what people think, at least. Okay. Subject matter and specialization. Localism in philosophy is not a matter of physical space, a, a physical place. We can also shut ourselves off from criticism and op conversation by retreating into inaccessible hyper specializations and technicalities. Uh, Frank Bitch time. Hi, welcome. And how you doing? It feels a bit early to conclude that globalization failed. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. I'm not saying it failed. I'm just saying oh, the author here is saying that it's getting we're getting a bit of pull pushback at this point. And uh, what should be done as a uh, because we're getting pushback. And so I don't think I don't think it's failed. But like, I agree with what you're saying. But like, what do we do now where things are not just always getting uh that's not like the main uh the number one thought anymore is just like you know make it more international viper says i made myself a bowl of cereal but he outlined how he intends to ensure that this initiative remains inclusive and doesn't devolve into intellectual colonialism um yes that's right and he was very concerned about that bowl of cereal um yeah well he has not yet gotten to it he said he was going to talk about that below um, so I don't know what he actually intends to do about, he, I mean, he was saying something that this is, this looks like a new direction for a journal. So like, how do you actually make the journal get alternate perspectives in? <laughs> I meant to say made cereal. 
Um, so I may have missed it, but oh, am I missing something? <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, he hasn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I misread your sentence. No, he's not gotten there yet. He's been claiming, uh, and what Frank uh, Big Time was commenting on, was saying, like, basically that the concepts of globalization that were driving, like, this international push earlier in the 20th century have started to crack up a little bit, um, is basically what I was saying. And he was giving examples up here of, um, like up th in like this section here that there actually are national philosophies where people are starting to make philosophies like Zambian humanism, like uh, this example right here, where it was explicitly where people have localized um, kind of philosophies. No, no. So no problems. Not, none at all. Feel, and if anyone misses anything or doesn't understand something, feel free to ask. Like, it's not like it's that hard to go back for two seconds just so um, you can figure out what where we are. Yeah, so this is the thing. What are we doing now that we're not, like, just basically focusing on the international? <clears throat> so, he continues. Localism in philosophy is not just a matter of physical place. We can shut ourselves off from criticism and conversation by retreating into inaccessible hyper-specialization and technicalities. And I know all the regulars here will know. Like, uh, that paper we read last time on um, fictionalism turned into this, like nitpicky paper about grounding which is a hyper specialization and technicalities which does not really help anyone except the people who are interested in that stuff okay while the divisions of scientific labor has its place and while specialization is often conducive to excellent philosophical inquiry uh, philosophical inquiry risks sterility if it incentivizes highly specialized work that conforms to narrow disciplinary or even sub-disciplinary standards. Yeah, so this is the issue. It, like, it becomes, like, sterile. And I'm trying to think of good emotes that would show this. So you risk sterility. Viper says, The reason is because while capitalism scaled, it has rendered the other pillar of society, democracy, limited, and parochial in comparison. Yeah, that's... I think I, I agree with that sentiment. Um, capitalism in the United States was much better when the Soviet Union was around because the U.S. government was very afraid that we would all go communist. And so what they did was they tried to make our lives better all the time to show that we were living better than the communists. But as soon as the, the threat of communism fell, then they were just like, yeah, screw it. Just do whatever you want now in capitalism. And it's gotten ugly. So I guess that's the like my view from the United States, but like the democracy has fallen uh, like underneath the uh, capitalistic framework, which is not very good for democracy, but it's very good if you have a lot of money. Okay. In the decades prior to the financial crisis of 2008, when Anglo-American philosophy departments were relatively financially healthy, a narrowly defined research niche in a fashionable topic could provide easily provide easy rewards in the early career of a young philosopher. With cleverness or a good advisor in graduate school, one's work could be crafted to satisfy uh, the preferences of a manageably small number of specialists. Their approval was a necessary condition for professional advancement. Securing a tenured position in the traditional American philosophy department was largely a matter of adequately conforming one's work to the demands of local experts in one's specialization. This model of how we certified one another as experts and the incentive structure that resulted gradually cultivated a risk-averse spirit of caution and conformism among philosophers. Yeah, this is what I said. I said, this is like one of the few people I'm just going to be inherently uh, agreeing with. Like, yes, this is exactly what it is. Everything like you're good, we read on this a lot of times is talking inside baseball to uh, other people. And every so often we get a nice paper about some topic. Like the first paper we read last time was on hope. That was nice. I hadn't read anything about the uh, philosophy of hope. But in the end, they were mostly arguing with themselves. Even so. Okay. In defense of this tendency, we tend to cite notions of increased professionalism. We praise the epistemic humility of modest modest research agendas and we note the collective and incremental nature of philosophical progress but less charitable interpreters might suspect that when young philosophers retreat into narrow niches they are simply adopting a strategy for professional advancement either way the current incentive structure of academic philosophy in the united states favors cautious and modest research agendas for the early career philosophers philosophical inquiry thrives when it is conducted in a spirit that risks overachieving a bit and welcomes criticism Philosophy thrives when its creative, skeptical, and self-critical core is not subordinated to excessively cautious American-style professionalism or to, or to equivalent demands from other local elites or traditions. Uh, 
Okay, yeah. Frank, yeah, Vipers, I'm sure, has many things to say. <laughs> okay, the, the kinds of localism that become dominant in Anglo-American philosophy are just one example of the kinds of pressures that global philosophy, it's, it's, uh, global philosophy sets itself against. The factors that shape the work of philosophers always tend to be dominated or at least influenced by local concerns. Moreover, the incentive structures and labor conditions that we encounter vary dramatically from country to country. The topics we pursue, the style we adopt, the way our work is divided between teaching, research, and engagement with public life will depend largely on the educational system in which we find ourselves and the expectations and education that have formed us. I hope that global philosophy can be a counterweight to the immediate local pressures that shape the lives of philosophers. I hope that it can be a venue where one's work will be read and appreciated by an audience well beyond your home base. Yeah, I mean, this is a uh, pie in the sky crap at this point. Um, but like, you know, it's like you hope that it can be a venue like anything here this is all pie in the sky crap. So, yeah, I agree, uh, Vipers. Um, but like compared to what? all the other wonderful philosophy journals. I mean, you see when I load up uh, and I'm searching for papers, I'm just scrolling through pages and pages of stuff. There's no reason why this is going to be any worse than any of the others. I mean, will it reach these lofty goals? No idea. Um, might it do something different? Maybe? I have no idea. But like, yeah, so they're going to try. And it does seem like a nice idea at least. Okay. So here, and here's where we're going with this. Here's what he wants to do. Global philosophy as a large scale generalist journal. As an editor, there are some steps that I will take to promote this ideal. As a practical matter, our discipline is in, a de is in desperate need of a large generalist journal that can offer a home to creative philosophical work from a growing international community. Axio Matthies has done this and its editorial practices have been marked by open-mindedness and objectivity under the leadership of, Robert, of Roberto Poli. In the last year that I have edited the journal and I have worked to follow the example of his... Oh, in the last year I have edited the journal and I have worked to follow the example of his strong leadership. Okay, so this is Axiom Matthews. Axiom Matthews was a, like, it's not a top tier journal, but it was like a legit journal in philosophy. Um, so he's taking on already an established journal of Axiom Matthews. Um, we can look it up in a minute, or we could do that now. But like, okay, so this is what he's doing. He's taking over an established journal, Axiom Matthews. Um, which I think was doing somewhat technical philosophy. It was like, you know, like uh, mathematically informed uh, philosophy. I don't remember. But um, yeah, so that's what he's doing. And we, I was kind of uh, was wondering where he was going. All right, like many other journals in the discipline, we now face challenging issues related to the scale of philosophical research. Viper says, I get the sense as an American, he's approaching it as a melting pot rather than multiculturalism. Parsing it as a programmer, it's like he thinks he can create a working program using competing design patterns. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the question is what sort of editorial board is he really going to put together, Vipers? Like, I can see what you mean. Like, you can get yourself into, like, um, different design patterns and, like, how are they actually judging the papers that get in? So we'll see. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, and so, and this is one of the problems, the scale of philosophical research. The number of submissions to philosophy journals has increased dramatically over the past two decades, and top journals have become extremely selective to the point where acceptance rates in our discipline are lower than in some of the most important venues in the natural sciences. Yeah, if you were trying to get yourself into a top philosophy journal, which I have tried to do, you have almost no chance just based on the numbers. Like, even if you have top tier research, the idea that you're going to get in is low just based on like they take just a few papers like from like and you can't quite tell it's, like, it's too subject to luck. Author says it is not conducive to the health of our discipline for a variety of obvious reasons. Yeah, but like the idea that he can solve that is like, well, how would he have any way even as the editor of a journal being able to solve this sort of thing is massively unlikely. Okay. The experience of submitting a paper to a journal in philosophy is increasingly frustrating and time-consuming. Actually, maybe this is my problem, but I don't give a fuck at this point. I just send them the stuff. Most of the time, they will take it. Um, and then only when you need, if it gets accepted, will they actually get angry and say you have to fix it. Viper says, one pattern has to mediate how all, how all the others work together, and that's the one with all the power, which in this case is going to be the Anglophone traditions. Um, 
Yeah, well, this is what he's saying. He wants to shake it up. Like, I don't know how he's going to do that in terms of, of the uh, editorial board. I just don't understand. But he hasn't said yet either. Um, yeah, I just don't know. Like, so, I mean, like I said, he has engaged with other uh, philosophical traditions. I don't know with how deeply he is uh, engaged with other ones, but like I said, he had worked with... Um, uh, philosophers out of the uh, Muslim world, the uh, Islamic philosophy. And so I know he's been engaged with them. So I don't know what he's actually going to think he's like, how he's actually going to structure it. If it's going to be a like a Western style of uh, organization or maybe slightly different. Yeah. Um, okay, the experience of submitting a paper to a journal of philosophy is increasingly frustrating and time-consuming. Time-consuming, yes. I don't give a shit, so I don't find it as uh, frustrating as it used to be. Overburdened referees seem more interested in quickly finding reasons to reject submissions, and editors are struggling to simply keep up with the deluge of papers and therefore generally defer to referees. Yeah, now running a journal is getting to be nearly impossible. That's part of That's true. Submitting a paper is easy. Uh, running a journal um, is terrible. Just as importantly, with some exceptions, the most highly regarded philosophy journals are ensconced in small communities of Anglo-American philosophers who have been educated to attend to a specific range of acceptable style and content. Where our discipline has made room for philosophical work outside this relatively narrow range, it has tended to do so in more technical areas of the discipline, in applied ethics, or in more marginal subspecialties. Philosophy of science, formal epistemology, logic, and some areas of applied ethics have provided space for philosophers from outside the dominant universities to publish. So far, there has been no large-scale venue for generalist and non-technical philosophy that is not subject to some of the localist conditions of contemporary philosophy publishing described here. I hope that global philosophy can serve this role in the years ahead. Again, pie in the sky, I hope so too, but we'll have to see where he's getting. More pie in the sky stuff. The transition to a large generalist journal does not mean a reduction in the standards of quality that bring readers to high quality uh, philosophy journals, nor does it mean that we will turn away from the topics that Axiomathes traditionally focused on. Rather, my goal is to broaden the scope while making the decision and referee process speedier. To do this, I will endeavor to quickly reject papers that are unlikely to succeed in a rigorous referee process while calling on a broad international editorial board to offer a wide range of perspectives. Okay, so here's what he's going to do. He's going to he's going to be the <laughs> you have to get it past him. So you he will endeavor to quickly reject papers. So as the uh, head editor, he's just going to like put the kibosh on you know a lot of stuff interesting but all right we'll see how that works he's gonna be reading a lot of crap a lot of crap in the months and years ahead i hope to steadily grow both the membership of the board and the number of papers and special issues we publish i will not be looking for reasons to reject good work and frankly i would rather risk publishing a bad paper than miss the chance to publish an important but imperfect paper this change will take time and will require the expansion of the journal and the editorial board in the years to come. I hope that you will join me in working towards this goal. Philosophy has thrived in the, philosophy thrived in the United States during the 20th century in part because it was not American philosophy. Life and energy was breathed into the musty pragmatist tradition by mid-century philosophers from Europe and elsewhere. Logic, metaphysics, philosophy of science, epistemology, moral philosophy, and philosophy of mind thrived in the United States thanks to the happy combination of massive public investment in higher education after, second, after the Second World War and an influx of talent from abroad. It is still the case that many of the world's greatest philosophers live and work in the United States, and it is still possible to become a very well-educated philosopher in some of its colleges and, and universities. However, the situation is changing. Disinvestment in, in public higher education over the past two decades has changed matters significantly. A new kind of American philosophy has emerged since the 1990s with its own idiosyncratic local concerns. A national philosophy, or rather a national culture of philosophy, has emerged that is oriented towards a distinctively American set of concerns and way of thinking about philosophy. While I am editor, global philosophy will be based in the United States, and I will count on the support of American com on the American community of philosophers. But my hope is that the most that most of the editorial board will be drawn from outside the English-speaking world within a few years. This will be a journal that serves as a friendly interlocutor to the new national philosophy of the United States. I will stumble and make mistakes in my role as editor-in-chief, and I ask for you to be patient with me in the years as Axiomathes becomes global philosophy. Okay. So, John Simmons is nuts. 
Uh, Viper says, Lumpy and I were talking the other day about how there is no true bilingualism. There's always a primary language and a translation to the primary language and likely compromised in that uh, translation. Um, yes and no. I, I One of the uh, philosophers I have been spending way too much time in his chat because he's like streaming for many hours every day. So whenever like I'm around, I have it on. Um, let's give him a shout out actually. Um, the Daniel Matt. So this is a, uh, he is a Swiss writer and he, his first language is French for certain. And he only writes in French, like he writes books in French. He just won some award for like his la one of his last books. Um, so he's a sci-fi, like he wrote, it was like sort of a kid, uh, teenage sci-fi book or whatever he wrote. But, um, he writes everything in French because he feels most confident and he expresses himself best in French. The He organizes his books in English, though. So he does all the logical reasoning in English. And then he does um, his writing in French. And so it's like, yes, you can do th certain things in one language. And you're, like the one you grow up with, that's where you have all your emotion tied. You have all your history. But like when you're doing other work you sometimes you want to separate that out and so the idea that like you're always going to be compromised in the other language yeah it's not going to have the same feel to it but then you also get the benefits maybe you're more objective in the foreign language because you don't think the same way in that one and so you get different opportunities so i don't know if i'd um characterize it as like primary secondary of course like the one you grow up with is going to be primary but that doesn't mean there aren't benefits to the other language and you might not be uh, so limited Anywho, but yeah, so you can go check out the Daniel Matt. Like I said, uh, he's a, he seems like a good guy. Uh, you know, like he sits around, like he play, he plays games, but he'll just like stop for an hour, like at some random spot, and just like talk to chat, like and discuss stuff. He's like, I like having conversations. His his uh stream is basically just chatting, but with like extra steps, which involve playing video games, and he's a competent video game player too. So, anywho. So, like, this is Axiom Matthews saying we're going in a new direction. Um, John Simmons is like, be like, screw it, we're going to not do the thing everyone else is doing, which is, you know, focusing on, like, very, very narrow, very, very high-quality stuff in one little area. And instead, he's going to try to get some, like, uh, international flavor, whatever that international feel and flavor actually is. So, anyone have any, like, ideas about this? Like, I know... Um, like, the reason Vipers brought this up, I'm sure, is because the idea that you're actually going to do something international, you're actually going to have multiple perspectives, is that basically the argument is that you're not actually, you, you, what you're going to do is you have your one thing that you do, and then everything else will be less good. So instead of this actually being a good journal, it's just going to be a second rate in all, all the other things. And I take that, that was uh, Viper's point, is that basically they're setting themselves up to fail because they're setting themselves up to be not as good at any one thing, but instead just be kind of mediocre in a bunch of other stuff. And that's a definite, um, risk that is a uh, like risk that they have here so um let's see what we can do is let's go take a look at axie matthews at the moment actually i can just go here journals axio matthews okay so, like, y we can look at the things here, and uh, so they're still publishing, like, right now. These are contemporary stuff. So, we've got um, Newton to cost on hypothetical mo models and logic and on, and on the modal status of logical laws. So, this is a basically a technical uh, argument here on logic. And so, these, again, so we're talking about life as engineering, about the origins of human ability crea to create constructs of reality. These are structural things, like technical work. Tindario says, I prefer to talk and write in English compared to German, but mostly because the modern German language with all the ang anglicism and other made up words. Okay, yeah, like, so, I mean, that's unfortunate for German that you're not able to express yourself uh, as well as you'd like to. But yeah, it's kind of funny that you're annoyed that you have to use English crap in the German. 
Frank Big Time says, even if it doesn't succeed, a team made up of people from many local philosophies should not should see things that a team made up of entirely drawn from one philosophy won't. So maybe at a cost of cohesiveness. Yeah, and I think that's what uh, John Simmons was uh, hinting at, saying it's going to take a long time for to get this organized. So it would be it's really going to be on him to keep it together. And I think Vipers actually made a comment about that earlier too. Uh, yeah, so Tinder <laughs> says, so basically a lot of German sounds like children with the modern use of language. Yeah, they're throwing in words from that they don't really understand. Viper says, yeah, one tradition will always, by necessity, take the lead. The rest will be assimilated. John Simmons is the Borg. He might accept that. Um, yeah. But, like, you can see, who are we talking about here? Like, why was he the editor? He was, he's a person who wrote on logic. So we're talking about people who write on modal status of logical laws, on the onto-epistemological status of the empty set and pure, pure singleton. So we're talking about philosophy of mathematics here. So this is a philosophy of set theory, uh, the pure singleton. Um, defining the undefined. Um... Oh, wow, a retracted article. Categorical inference and co convert realism. Structural ontology versus normal, lo normal logical axiomatics. I wonder why this was a retracted. That's interesting. Frank Big Time says, It's not obvious that the Borg assimilate everything. Assimilating everything is a worse universe than this one. No, it's not. Um, we just seem to... What was it? Um, the reason the Borg or the way they were was... I mean, that was the next generation. What? When was that? Was that? That wasn't like anti-communist. Was that um, like the Borg? Were they like this sort of like collective? So were they just uh, anti-Russian? I forget what it was. Sort of the idea of the Borg as this um, thing. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So these are all technical papers. Like these are all uh, more technical philosophy. Type token distinction. Four problems with the proprietarian IP justifications. How does the theoretical term refer? So these are all. Um, yeah. Like this was a technical journal of philosophy. Oh, we had Aristotle's philosophy of mind. That's kind of cool. So they had like a, one ancient here, but that's not what they normally do. Epistemic relativism, probability, and forms of subjectivity. Okay, so. You know, this is a little bit uh, general, but like I guess they want to go much farther. Diagrams, conceptual space and time, and latent geometry. Again, more philosophy of math here. So, logic, philosophy, and physics, a critical commentary on the dilemma of categories. So, this is where we're going from, and they're trying to uh, go wider. They're trying to use this as a basis to uh, allow for other stuff. You know? Me being uh, the softy for John Simmons, I and maybe I will submit something to Axie Matthews. Um, but yeah, so like if we click on this, let's go here and see what the journal looks like. So yeah, this is published by Springer, um, Axie Matthews. Yeah. Oh, see, and now it's already changed the name, Global Philosophy. So Axie Matthews Global Philosophy, like you can, I, you can't see this little picture right here, but like they have a new cover and like a and label up here. So interesting. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is what I mean. Technical philosophy. We're getting like a function uh, arguments and like uh, things like that. Category theory. Mm hmm. On the experimental foundation of uh, computing. Yeah, see, this could have been like... This paper offers a review of Giuseppe Primero's book on the foundations of computing, mathematical engineering, and experimental foundations of the science of computing are examined. Okay, blah, blah, blah. But like, this is what I mean. Okay. So, this is just very interesting. So, how do things get changed, and how is this a good idea? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, aims and scope. Let's see what the aims and scope are. Yeah, so they've changed it to this one, uh, two sentence uh, thing now. Global philosophy welcomes submissions from all areas of philosophy. We int intend to be a general journal of philosophy for the entire community, regardless of geography or philosophical tradition. Interesting. So, yeah, there we go. The end of Axiom Matthews as I knew it, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It was not ever uh that high up on the uh like rankings of philosophy journals no one was like oh yeah axiom is the place to go for your philosophy but still it was a respected venue um yeah all right so that was interesting thank you valpo we get to see what john simmons is up to i don't know if it's a good idea 
but he's trying to do something here, which, um, yeah, so, like, he's trying to do something, which is kind of fascinating. Uh, global philosophy. <laughs> 